Yo, 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 what's up, everybody? Thank you for tuning in to today's podcast. It's Cody Gotham's Cape Crusader, and we're keeping it geekly. Yes, this is your number one stop for all things geek culture, from comic books to video games and so much more. And man, oh, man, do I not only have some heavy-hitting news and some fresh comics right out the oven, but I have an awesome announcement for you guys. Olivia and myself are finally able to lock down a house, and we will be moving here shortly and hopefully be all in by the 1st of June. With that being said, we are going to be pausing the Marvel side of things just for a little bit until I have this move completely done and everything is unpacked and put away. So without further hesitation, let's go ahead and dive right into that geekly news you guys all came here for. So in an interesting turn of events, it looks like Seagate has somehow created a hard drive that can now rival the speeds of a SSD. Yes, you heard that right. Seagate has created a HDD with transfer speeds that can rival a SATA base solid drive, but it's also the world's biggest hard drive at a behemoth of a size of 14 terabytes. Now, while this is a pretty insane creation, one thing to note via Tom's hardware is this is only getting close to sustaining transfer speeds of SATA base SSDs, which are mainstream. With its current size, this isn't going to be able to plug into just your normal gaming PC computer. Uh, it's also going to need a SAS 12 GBSP interface rather than the typical ones that you get on most motherboards. So Seagate was able to do this by instead of using a helium based chamber, they used a Mach 2 technology with a twin accurate arm capable of operating independently. So while this might not change the PC world as we know it, it's definitely going to be unique to see a hard drive of this size and magnitude be used and to see what its full capabilities are. One thing that is definitely pushing the capabilities of what is thought to be legal is going to be Elon Musk's new Roadster, which is going to use rocket thrusters to take its users from 0 to 60 in 1.1 seconds. So right off the rip, there is some crazy speculation floating around on how Musk is going to be able to do this. This is going to be the fastest car in production history, and it's going to somehow have to be street legal with rocket boosted performance. We have a 2015 Porsche 918 Spider that's currently boasting a 0 to 60 acceleration at 2.1 seconds, and that is the world record. This is going to be beating that by a full second. At the Peterson Automotive Museum in Los Angeles, exhibitors were able to see the new Tesla on display and actually tweeted at Musk, and he responded with a pretty outstanding tweet in itself um, saying that this is going to have rocket thruster option package and it's going to be very intense and probably not wise for those with a medical condition so as we can see most roller coasters give off four to five g's of gravitational force pull which is about four to five times heavier than what you normally feel to give you an idea of what this means most fighter jet pilots are trained to withstand up to eight or nine g's of force for extended periods of time with the car having the option to go this fast i could definitely see some trouble and some pretty horrific accidents in the near future but that all falls on the driver itself uh, i mean i have no idea how he's going to pull it off but i am definitely interested in seeing how it happens and this brings us to our last topic of news for the week and this one's going to be a juicy one guys it looks like square enix is set to announce a new action rpg final fantasy spinoff with e3 up and around the corner the rumors are just going crazy mayhem is afoot and what do you know it looks like we have a new title from square enix dropping and this time it was leaked in the reddit and gaming form reset era it looks like the rumors are indicating that square enix is going to be working with none other than Team Ninja. Now, Team Ninja is known for games like Ninja Gaiden, Neo, and Final Fantasy Dissida NT. And it even looks like the rumors are going on to state that this might be a Souls-like game taking place in a world adjacent to the one found in the first Final Fantasy game. Now, while the rumor is kind of barren, it looks like this is going to be announced during Square Enix's huge, huge show during E3 and this is going to be exclusive to the PS5 with a later date slated for the PC launch. Now, being a huge Final Fantasy fan myself, this is something that has me pretty excited. I'm, I'm stoked to see if this becomes a Souls-like game and that it's going to be set in the world similar to the one that we got to experience on the NES. With that being said, guys, that does wrap up this week in Geek, but stay tuned. We got those fresh polls coming straight out the oven. We are going to be diving straight into Robin issue number two, written by Joshua Williamson, with art being done by Glev Melnikoff. As we begin this issue, we see Robin starting to wake up as he begins to heal with Ravager right in the corner watching him, telling him how embarrassing it was that Robin died because he wouldn't listen to her. So after Flatline ripped out his heart, Mother Soul explained the rules of the tournament. 
everybody needs to die at least one time to begin the tournament and if anyone dies more than twice if they die three times their soul is forever banished the last survivor is going to gain immortality as soon as ravager tells him that he can kill without any sort of remorse or regret robin gets to work quickly dismantling everyone around him and this is when she goes on to explain the five that he needs to look out for on this island so his five top threats are going to be none other than respawn xxl flatline herself black swan and hawk ravager on the other hand is not here to fight she's here for her own needs at which point she does not explain to robin but she is pretty insistent on training robin and robin's not having any of that later on we see robin overseeing the island at which point flatline sneaks up on him and she wants to be his friend but robin on the other hand is still pretty salty at losing to her and it's at this point we see robin break off and as he's leaving ghost alfred comes out of nowhere to confront him and robin's having none of this he's not going to confront his father about this he's going to handle this on his own at which point he runs into ravager and she's insistent still that he needs her training but it's not to kill it's for fun overall i thought the issue was pretty interesting uh the concept of the lazarus pith bringing people back and upon their third death they are forever banished puts a heavy toll on everyone in the book now this is going to lead us to batman detective comics issue 1036 written by dev donovan with art being done by dan mora now this book starts off really interesting as we see a limping woman out of nowhere heading towards bruce wayne's apartment and she collapses and as he's holding her she begins screaming out of nowhere alerting the presence of one of his nosy neighbors now as bruce is rushing into his apartment he gets a quick glimpse and this could be clayface but there's not much time as gotham pd is knocking and they want to search his apartment his neighbor made a report that there is a woman screaming and bruce kidnapped her and took her into his apartment now after bruce is able to convince them that it was just a horror movie turned up they leave and as they're leaving he opens up his duffel bag and it appears that this is Sarah Worth as Clayface. Now, in a really quick panel, we see two of Penguin's henchmen walking in City Hall's district. And they're looking for something strange, but it's not long before they are attacked by some crazy-looking lunatic with a knife in their hand. And this gives us a quick segue to Bruce on the rooftop with the duffel bag. And that nosy neighbor is at it again as she's watching him and she's wondering what is going on. Now, as she makes her way out the door, though, she's quickly subdued and grabbed by someone in the shadows. And that's the last we see of her. And this gives us a quick another transition to Batman held up by none other than the Huntress. Now, this leads to a really tense situation as the Huntress has Batman dead to rights with the crossbow pointed right at his head. And there's no way for him really to get out. Now, as they begin arguing and going back and forth with the Huntress, wondering if he's the murderer, we see Clayface make an escape from the duffel bag, and this leads them down to the streets of Gotham. Now, whatever this is, it turns back into the wounded Sarah Worth, and that is confronted by some random passerby, and they begin getting attacked. And that's when Batman and the Huntress steps in, and they quickly are overwhelmed. And this is when Batman makes a really interesting announcement. He, he wonders why they murdered Sarah Worth, and this is when this... Reacher just melts away and runs into the sewer. Now, it's right at this moment we see Batman and the Huntress come upon Lady Clayface. And after they make their way safely to the Micro Cave 7A, they begin the interrogation. It looks like during A Day, Lady Clayface was, for lack of better words, not able to hold on to her human form and she began drifting away. She was able to witness the murder of Sarah Worth and she doesn't really remember too much after that. Now, after the interrogation, we see the pair learn about Neil Betterman, and they make their way to go ahead and confront him, and this gives us a smooth transition back to the Penguin who has that man from earlier before that tried to kill his henchmen. Now, we see these crazy pink tentacles are forming from his eyes before he's killed, and this gives us another segue back to Batman and the Huntress confronting Neil on the roof and he's covered in blood and he has those same tentacles coming from his eyes now this leaves us with the interesting question of what are these pink tentacles and who's causing this mayhem within gotham that's turning these people crazy and causing them to kill one another now this is going to lead us to our last issue of the week which is going to be teen titans academy issue number three written by tim sheridan with art being done by rafia sandoval and with the ogt titans in flight to rescue some meta teens out of markova and it's during this flight that we see Raven have some crazy visions about the children back at the tea tower. Beast Boy wants to turn around. The cyborg assures him that's what the upperclassmen are there for. That's what they're training for and they can handle it. You know, does he want to sacrifice saving these children or does he want to turn the jet around and go see what's going on? Now, it's at this point we see Peacemaker leading the Suicide Squad with Red X at the helm 
as they are getting ready to take on the T Tower. Red X has some pretty interesting technology, this cloaking device that as long as they stay within range, gives them the appearance of weak Teen Titan members of the school. And I thought that was really cool that it was able to cloak them like that. And we also see this technology as it's scanning the halls and keeping Red X three steps ahead of the game. Now, as Crush is listening to this loving message from her father, Lobo, we see Roundhouse and she gets really upset as he, as he walks in, but it's his turn to head the shift. And then that's when we see Kid Flash and all the rest of the team make their way. And Crush is pretty upset because she's feeling rather left out. There's tons of new refugees at the school, more than what the OG members can count. And they're kind of just left sandwiched in between because the OG team members come back and they're not really... They're not really given enough credit, she feels. And that's what I'm kind of assuming in this issue. That's what I'm led to feel, at least. This then gives us a nice little breakdown of Bolt and her history. We go seven years back in Australia. and We find out what happened. She was able to read these equations correctly in the right order. And that gave her access to the Speed Force somehow. And she began running trafficking missions for her parents. And it was pretty gruesome. They ran into the wrong crowd. And then, for lack of better words, she lost her legs. Now we see Amanda Waller at this point give her new legs, you know, the blades. And she makes her make a promise that whenever Waller calls, Bolt is going to come running. And then that leads us to the present day because Bolt has been running from Waller. And that's why the Suicide Squad is there. Now Red X and Peacemaker go head to head. He wants to know if maybe the old speedster died and that's why they're trying to take a kid. Because, you know, he has them all, you know, they're all upset because Waller told them that these are just kids and to treat them like they're weapons. And this really raised an interesting point. Now back at the T-Tower, we see Superboy break the BioCloak's range, and this causes the tower's alarm system to go off, triggering everybody to convey on their scene. And this is when things get really heated as a huge battle happens. As this fight begins, we see Amanda Waller tell them to get the extraction at all costs. And she tells Talon to kill whatever he needs to to get her. As Talon is given the kill order, we see Red X make a really strange decision. It seems that he switched sides as he goes to defend the children before they're killed. And this indicates that he's not as bad as a guy that we originally thought, but he's not Team Amanda Waller. So all eyes are on Red X and we're left wondering what's going to happen in issue number four. With that being said, guys, that does wrap up today's podcast. As always, if you enjoy this type of content, be sure to hit that big red subscription button and turn on notifications to be alerted anytime we drop new content. You can follow me on all my social media platforms at Twitter, Twitch, Instagram, YouTube, and so much more at Job for a Cody. And as always, guys, keep it geekly.